Well, good morning. Today we're going to talk about something that you are never, ever confronted with, and that's temptation. The beautiful thing is that the scripture is always universally true. Although the applications may change somewhat, the principles never change because it's written by God for our instruction so that we might learn to be more like the people that God has called us and enabled us to be. Amen? Amen. And so what we do is we go through the scriptures line at a time. We're in the book of Genesis in chapter 39. We've come upon the, the crux of the Sunday school lesson, which how many of you have been to Sunday school and heard about Joseph in Sunday school? Okay. Well, good. Well, all these people. None of you. Okay, that's interesting how it separates out. But if you've been to Sunday school, you know, David and Goliath and, and Joseph and his temptation, I'm not sure they go into the PG version of it. But we're going to read it right from the scripture as it's written. So as we do, I'll, I'll try to click through the slides in a way that actually works. So last week... We looked at this little hiccup in the, in the narrative about Judah and Tamar and all of the weirdness that that is. And if, if you weren't here, that's okay. You can pull it up on YouTube and, and look at it. It's a stark contrast to the life of Joseph. Judah decides he's going to do his own thing with his own family. He pulls away from his brothers. He intermarries with uh, somebody of the area, and he's hanging out with a guy uh, who's an Adullamite, and they, they like parties and that kind of thing. And he ends up finding himself a Canaanite cutie and, and having children. And two of them die because of their wickedness. And uh, one of them he holds on to and doesn't want to let go, although he should and should have, and he didn't. Uh, so the whole story of that, I won't go into it um, because you guys that were here last week will be hearing it again. And once is enough for anyone. <laughs> So this week, we're getting back to the narrative of Joseph. Now, if you remember what had happened with Joseph, he was the 11th in line. Now, I don't know if you're a, a firstborn or a lastborn or in the middle, but he certainly was towards the tail end of his family. And all of his brothers, all of them that were older than him, hated him. They wanted to kill him. And they threw him in a pit. They tore up his coat and they drenched it in blood and handed it to their dad and said, is this your son's coat? Because it kind of looks like his. And he says, oh, my son is dead. He's been torn to bits by a beast. And he mourns. And he says, I will die mourning. I will go down to my dying breath mourning my son. Because he was his favorite. Don't have favorites. It's not a good idea. I had one boy and one girl. I was very lucky. I could tell each one of them they were my favorite little boy and little girl in the whole world. <laughs> I'm not sure it would work for you but it worked for me. So here's, we're going to look at Joseph who gets sold as a slave. He doesn't get killed. He gets thrown in a cistern. He gets thrown in, in the earth probably for three days because he's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. In fact, many of the things that Joseph does, maybe at the end, if, if, uh, if you guys have some strength, I'll go through the hundred things where Joseph is just like Jesus and he's a, a precursor to it. But he gets thrown in the ground, and eventually they sell him off as a slave, and they send him away, and he goes to Egypt. And so we're going to pick up the story there in verse 1 of chapter 39. Now, Joseph, Joseph has been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer to Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So Joseph, who was all that and so much more in his own household, overseeing all of his brothers, now is a nobody. And he's a slave. And yeah, you can, back then they were selling people. And they, they got some silver for him, which is always the redemptive metal. Interesting, as it goes through scripture. Same thing with Jesus. If you remember, he was turned in for pieces of silver. I, I can go off the rail at any moment. And so he's sold off to them and he becomes a slave and he's obliged to do whatever they say because he was sold by his brothers. The interesting thing is he goes to the auction block and he's auctioned off 
and somebody sees something in him, Potiphar, who's the head executioner in Egypt. There's a guy you don't want to get angry. So much more than uh, watching prisoners. These, this guy's in charge of executions. So Potiphar, which is his office actually, not his given name, he's a, what's called a eunuch. Um, many eunuchs are made so, so that they will not uh, proliferate little humans in your harem. How was that? That was as G as I could get it. But some eunuchs, it was a position that they held and it, it was an office. It wasn't necessarily a biological condition. So he has a wife. So I'm hoping for her sake that that's not the case, but he has a wife. And so Potiphar sees something in this young man and he buys him to come home with him and to be his slave. I don't know how many of you feel like a slave at your work, but this is different. <laughs> this is a bit different than what you're doing. You're selling yourself for a price and you can leave and go anywhere you want or just be uh, you know, homeless. That's always a choice. It's not pleasant, but it is. He doesn't have a choice. And so he stays. And the funny thing is he serves and he serves well. So he figures, you know what? If if God has me here and I'm going to be sold off as a slave, I'm going to be the best darn slave anybody's ever seen. And Joseph puts his heart into this, into serving this man. I don't know about you, but I've had some employers that I had a little trouble doing that with because they benefited from my hours and my time and my labor and my ideas. In fact, took credit for most of them. Joseph doesn't complain, not one whisper. He submits himself to the position he's found in, I believe, because he has faith in God and because he believes that God has a plan for his life and he doesn't know what's going on necessarily, but he, know who's, he knows whose hand he's holding. You and I can learn a lesson from that. And if you know the story of Joseph and how it ends up, at this point in time, we all look at it with knowledge and say, we know exactly what God's doing, putting him in the place to be promoted but he doesn't know that. He doesn't have, you know, up to chapter 42 like we do. The story hasn't been written for him. So he's been disowned by his family, almost killed by his brothers, sold off for money as they waved goodbye and smiled. And he's not going to see his, his mother or his father for over 30 years. And off he goes and he's being sold as a slave. All of this while 17 years old. That's where Joseph is. And Potiphar, who's a guy who doesn't play games, says, yeah, I'm going to buy this guy. And he buys Joseph as a slave. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of the master. He was successful. He was successful because he submitted himself and realized it wasn't Potiphar that he was serving. It was God himself. It doesn't matter where you work or whatever you do. The scripture says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might and do it unto the Lord. You see, I'm, I'm not here because they pay me enough. I'm not here because I need an ego boost. I'm not here because I know so much more than all of you people. I'm here because I believe God's called me to be here. And you people obviously do because you're here. Do you know that you know that you know? that what you're doing, where you are, that God has called you to be there. doesn't need to be enjoyable. doesn't need to be a, a pleasure cruise. doesn't need to be a vacation. But the situation in which you are, do you realize that God's hand is upon you? Just like Joseph. No different. Except he has a little less assets than you do. And he's going to grow where he's planted. And he's not going to let this experience sour him. It's actually going to encourage him to put his back into it, so to speak. And so here's Joseph working hard for this pagan guy. Working hard. That, that hardly seems right. And yet it is because it glorifies God, doesn't it? Yeah. And we bear his image. And if you have the name Christian on you, that's a whole lot to live up to. It means little Christ. We have a lot to live up to. And Joseph is doing it. And so he's stepping up. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this. Now, no chastening seems to be good, 
seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see, we have a responsibility to allow things, difficulties, hardships to train us or else we just get sour and complaining. Amen? Amen. Okay, I'm not the only one. Good. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You see, Joseph knew something that we can learn. He wasn't working for Potiphar. He was working for the Lord. And he was going to accept this as God's sovereign hand in his life. And it was going to make him sweeter and not sour. How are you guys doing with that? I don't know about you, but, you know, I've, I've hit my thumb more than once. I cut my finger off once. I've done some things. And it has the strange effect of producing words. <laughs> and emotions and thoughts. And you could just take it out on anybody that happens to be around, right? It could be a perfectly good wall that you just put up and the hammer will go through that wall if you don't realize that there's a reason for that. Well, just keep your finger out of the way, of course. But you see, these difficult things that come our way, we have this rare opportunity to accept it as God's training of us. Anybody who's patient, anyone, they weren't born that way. It's not a genetic thing, you know, in their genetic code. It's because they underwent tremendous pressure, like a diamond. You don't get a diamond, you know, under the leaves. It's deep. And that's the kind of people that God makes when he puts the pressure on. And so there's this chastising. It's a word we don't use. I figured I'd look it up and just confuse you a little more. It's pedia. It means tutelage education or training by implication, disciplinary correction, instruction which aims at increasing virtue and curbing passion. So you see, it's not punishment per se, it's training. I went to basic training and they shot real bullets over my head. That was not punishment. I actually signed up for it. It's training. It's training so that when the real thing comes, you're not shocked into, you know, like, like a possum in the middle of the road. It's training. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he loves you so much he came and died for you. But he loves you so much he won't leave you the way you are. And so every one of us is going to undergo training. Right? So we learn to accept it like Joseph did and we'll grow by it. Now he's nobody. He's just a slave in Potiphar's house. Complete obscurity. He used to be the only son of his father in his father's eyes. He was well loved by his mom until his mom died, giving birth to Benjamin. And so now he's an outcast and he's in obscurity. This is a test. Can you live in obscurity with only your relationship with God? You will be tested. At some point, you will be tested. Joseph was tested. I think we get tested. When you feel like you're nobody and nothing and you're not doing what it is you think God's called you to and there's got to be something more to this life. Any of you experience the obscurity? Something is wrong in my life and something's not the way that it should be? God is training you. He's trying to train you. The best thing we can do is accept it. I went to Bible college in my early 20s. I didn't become a pastor of a church until I was 50. I can tell you what it's like to be in obscurity, to always be a backseat person, to be somebody in the background, always helping other people's ministries, but never really having one of your own. I can tell you what that feels like. And I'll bet if we went around the room, some of you understand what obscurity is. It might be that you're waiting for a mate for way too long might be that you're looking for a job for just way too long. Might be whatever it is, but you just feel like you're nobody. God wants you to learn a lesson. And the beautiful thing is, if you learn that lesson, you can move on and get promoted to second grade. 
That's what's happening here. He's being tutored, and it's to increase virtue and to curb his passion. It's to train him because he's going to have all authority in the world except for one. He is going to be the guy. This is good training for somebody who's a leader, don't you think? Learn how to serve the Lord in obscurity, and you'll learn how to serve him when you're in leadership. Verse 3, and so his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and he served him. And then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, he put under his authority. So Potiphar sees in this young man the potential to be a manager. This kid is slick. And everything he does turns to gold. Everything, because the Lord prospers him. I will tell you, it's a twofold thing. Joseph works hard, and the Lord prospers him. It says that he served Potiphar. He made a willing decision that it was an extension of who he was, living his life out before God. And so he worked, and he worked hard. The scripture is rife with all sorts of passages about work and how positive it is and how good it is. We try to get out of work. We try to do the least amount of work with the most amount of pay. We have this mentality. But boy, what a fulfilling thing it is to pour your heart into something you know God has called you to do. Amen? Amen. And we can do that. And so God's blessing is seen. You know, other people, if you're, if you're doing and living the life that God has called you to, other people will see something in your life and say, what is that? Like he just bawled you out and yelled in your face and you just like forgave him and walked away. Like, what's up with that? How can you handle it? I was going to punch him for you. You see, the blessing of God and the maturity of God, it, it's like an aroma that everybody should smell the presence of Christ on you. It was seen by Potiphar. The sacrificial service shows sacred secret. I worked hard on that. (laughs) Sacrificial service shows a sacred secret. You see, when we serve the Lord from our heart and we're not serving men primarily, that shows something. And people don't understand the motor that drives you when you can be gracious and do that. And so do that. Faithfulness in the face of slavery. Here he's a slave. Boy, you would think if anybody had to complain, it would be Joseph, right? In the face of slavery, he serves. I find that amazing. You know, being a servant is something that scripture talks about, being a steward, taking care of those things and serving other people. And I think everybody aspires to that, and certainly we have enough passages in Scripture to remind us of that. And yet, how many of you like to be treated like a slave? See, I I have no problem helping my wife out with something, but I get irritated if I'm sitting in a place and there's there's a soda or something on the table, and she's sitting next to me, and she goes, can you hand me that soda? You mean the soda that's right here within your arm's length? (laughs) The soda you could get all on your own? This is what I don't say. (laughs) But I give her the look. And I pick up the soda and move it over about 18 inches. Now I got an attitude. Everyone should be a servant, and it shouldn't even be a question. Which tells me I have a long way to go. (laughs) Little things that people can do, and they don't, they ask you to do. It's like, hey, I lost my phone. Could you call me? No. (laughs) You better figure out what you did with it. You're going to learn your lesson. You're going to learn to be trained right here. I'm not going to enable you to lose your keys and your phone and your wallet important pieces of paper and stuff. What do I look like, a servant? (laughs) Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. You're right, I am. Okay, all right, all right. I'll help you, I'll help you. Where's my phone? (gasps) My phone, where's my phone? (laughs) 
Joseph shows faithfulness in the face of slavery. Being treated like a slave, he rises and acts like a king. And he serves everybody, just like Jesus did. Prosperity, he's favored, he has authority, he has unlimited freedom, and he's trusted by Potiphar. These are the things that he earns because A, he's blessed by God, and B, he works and he has character. He doesn't need anybody telling him what to do. He knows exactly what to do, and he does it. Romans 11.29 says this, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Do you remember? Joseph was a manager back home at 17 years old over his brothers. His father had appointed him to do such a thing. I wonder if it had something to do more with him not being favored, but him being gifted that he was put in this place. And it's interesting because then he goes to Potiphar's house and what does he do? He starts organizing stuff. He starts taking over. He starts running things. He makes everything run smoothly. Make sure the food's coming in, the garbage is going out. People are doing everything that they're supposed to do. He's taking care of a large household. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And you're going to see this line run through Joseph's life all the way up to Pharaoh's throne. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, we're reminded of this. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, that's the word we use for slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name of which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every, na name, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father." How did Jesus ascend to such a high place when he left heaven and came and was incarnated in a body? He humbled himself into death on the cross and he was promoted. We're going to see this exact same principle with Joseph because he humbled himself. God is going to lift him up. If you are willing to humble yourself and be a servant, God will lift you up. And it doesn't matter who sees because God does. It says that he served him. I don't know how you feel about uh, putting money in a pagan's pocket or furthering their uh, debauchery. There are lots of reasons we can get out of doing good work. But he chooses to work. Notice, God chooses workers. Do you remember when James and John were called what they were doing? They were fishing. You remember Peter? Peter. He's fishing. Matthew is collecting taxes. Wow, I'm noticing a theme here. Gideon. I went to the Old Testament. I didn't really <laughs> shuffled it for you. He was working. What was David doing when Samuel had to get him called in? He was shepherding. God calls busy people. God calls busy people. Check it. Check the scriptures. Check every single one of them. God calls them when they're busy. They're busy doing something, and God calls them. Maybe you're next. Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 8, we're told this. Go to the ant, you sluggard. That's a lazy person, by the way, not a, not a non-crustaceous thing crawled on the ground. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Here's the bottom line Jersey version. The ant does not need a boss. The ant goes about its business and it works and it doesn't, doesn't need somebody to say, hey, you forgot that. You didn't do this. You do. No, they just go. We should be such self-motivated people, shouldn't we? We know what the Lord would have us do, and we get busy about it. And we don't need somebody telling me what to do, because I know what to do. It's a good thing, like the ant. 
And so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. So he's not just at home. He's out in the field as well. Thus, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread in which he ate. That means he didn't worry about anything. He didn't know what was in his bank account. He had no idea what was going on in his household. He had absolutely no oversight because no oversight was needed. Joseph knew what was going on and he was trusted implicitly with everything in his house. Could that be said of us? I would hope so. Don't worry about it. They're going to take care of it. You don't have to worry about it. They're a person of integrity. You don't have to be looking over their shoulder and telling them what to do all the time. So God chooses and blesses the one who works. I find this to be a principle and it kind of spurs me on. In John chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, it says this, For the Father judges no one, but he has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Jesus said this of himself, speaking of the Father, that he was sent by the Father. It's interesting. Anytime Joseph said something, he said it with the authority of Potiphar. It was as though Potiphar himself was telling people to do stuff. And in that, he's just like Jesus, isn't he? Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. A little red flag went up, right? And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. I'm not sure that line ever works. He's in charge of everything. Potiphar is gone doing work. And his wife looks at Joseph and said, I have to have you. Why is he so desirable? Men, there is, there is nothing more desirable than a man who works and his character. He wasn't bad looking either. <laughs> but he had character. And he was working. There's a man of influence. There's a guy who knows what he's doing. And what you have here is a desperate housewife. Something right out of TV. This test is going to be the test of Joseph's purity. Is he willing to be sexually pure? If somebody's going to be in the position of leadership, wouldn't you think there should be some training in this? Wouldn't you wish that people in the White House had such training? People in ministry would have such training. Young men who are thinking about getting married need training, and you will be tested in your sexual purity. Here he's being tested in sexual purity. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. In other words, he doesn't concern himself with looking over my shoulder, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in the house than I nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see where his focus is? It's on the Lord. How can I do this thing and sin against God? He says a few other things, which I think are interesting. Number one, it begins with the fear of the Lord, doesn't it? Because the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Yes. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. If you love God, you're going to hate evil. It's, it's part of the equation. Now, we live in a world where everybody, everybody just be nice to everybody and don't say anything, you know, use the right pronouns and, you know, just, you know, because we never know and you don't want to trigger anybody and, you know, you just have to be milk toast. And don't ever speak truth because that'll offend somebody. Uh, so don't ever speak truth to them. We live in a world that wants to water you down and snuff you out. Yep. Speak the truth in love and we will grow up in all things even to him who is ahead who is Christ Jesus. Amen. We speak the truth in love. So the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate, says the Lord. 
And so to love the Lord means to hate evil. And Joseph immediately said no. I can tell you when I learned to press a button, he's being ethically convicted. He knows what's right and what's wrong. And he's going to, he's going to show his spiritual devotion by saying no. You know no is a really good answer? How many of you have trouble saying no? How many of you have trouble raising your hand? All of you. Okay. Hey, can you do this for me on Monday? No. No, I can't. What about Wednesday? No. No, I can't do that. You know, no opens up the possibilities of all kinds of great things. If it's honest and it's real, no is a good answer, right? Hey, you want to help me with this? No. That weighs about 1,800 pounds. I'm not going to help you with that. Good answer. No is a good answer. First, he says this, you're his and not mine. Good idea when you're tempted to go lie with another woman to realize she's not yours. Doesn't matter if you're dating and you're not married. Doesn't matter if, she, if she's married to someone else. Doesn't matter what age they are. Not yours. That's the first thing you should know. Off limits. Not for me. There's only one for me. I am trusted completely. You see, he didn't need to accomplish anything. He didn't need to overcome. He didn't need to conquer anything to feel good about who he was. He says, I'm I have everything I need. I'm in control. I am the most important person in this house. So why would I go and do that? It's not going to add to who I am. I have absolutely no need. You know, there are a lot of men, ladies, maybe you don't know this, but they think of female conquering as a little badge of honor. They, they put a notch in their belt. Why? What did you accomplish? I knew a guy who ran out of belt. <laughs> the problem is he ran out of soul. He didn't value a human being for what a human being was. I have nothing to gain from this act and everything to lose. You see, he had everything and he was going to lose it all if he did this. And he knew it. And what you have to do is protect what you have by not taking on something you shouldn't. I will not sin against God. You know, every single one of us needs to rehearse that. I will not sin against God. Well, pastor, you sound awfully proud when you say that. No, I'm committing myself to God and I'm going to cry out that he gives me the strength to say no when it's time to say no. But it begins with me making a decision. I want him to be the Lord of my life. I want him as my boss so I can say no. Victor Hugo said um, once, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Any of you heard that before? Yeah. We're about to see what she's going to do in retaliation for his no, I will not. Joseph has an awareness. He has an awareness of God being there. When we walk around with that, it's called walking in the spirit in the New Testament. When we walk that way with an awareness of his thereness, we don't do the things that we would do in the flesh because otherwise we'd be just led by the flesh. But we have to be aware of his presence. So it was that she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Notice how he handled this. He said no, he meant no, he kept saying no, and he stayed away from her. Hey, Dave, how's your diet going? Oh, it's pretty good. Well, why are you standing there looking in the bakery window? Because it smells so good and it looks so good. And look, look at it make the dough. Look at the. <laughs> Is that raisin bread? I love, oh, cinnamon. Oh, it's good. Brown sugar, cinnamon rolls? Oh, my goodness. Now you're all salivating. I don't go to the bakery. Somebody say, hey, could you go to the bakery for me? Sure. <laughs> That's a mistake. It is a mistake. He didn't compromise. There was no reasoning with her. 
let's sit down, have a cup of coffee and discuss this. No. He said no to being open-minded. You know, you should just be a little more open-minded. I mean, this, this might work out well. No, it's not. It's not going to work out well. There's no reasoning, no conversation. There's no m finding a middle ground. Erase all of that junk from your brain. It's no, it means no, and I'm not going to do it. That's it. And you walk away, and you stay away from the thing that is tempting you. Right? Sometimes you have to take drastic actions. There's no lingering, no listening, no looking. You know those three things will, will lead to touching at some point. There's no exposure to temptation. He doesn't go near her. He stays away from her. I don't go to the bakery. Okay. We should say no daily. We should say no to all kinds of things on a regular basis. Exercise the no muscle. You know what I mean? All I, you know, like you guys, after this, we're all going to go into the next room and grab something to eat and all that. I walk around, you'll never see me eating because I'm exercising my no muscle. <laughs> I go out there, I walk around, I see you guys, I help clean up and see what's out. Oh, that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. No, 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 no. No, nothing here for me. Oh, celery, I can eat that. <laughs> but it's just no. It's just no. Exercise daily. You want to develop a muscle? That's what you do. James 127 says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Do you understand? That is pure and undefiled dedication to God. That one thing keeping yourself unstained from the world, caring for orphans and widows, those who can't care for themselves, those who are, are, are less fortunate than us, and keeping yourself unstained from the world. It's a mission, boys and girls. It's a mission. You feel me? It's a mission, and we're in a battle. Romans 16, 17 says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. There are people to avoid. Not bill collectors. I mean, if you owe a bill, pay the bill. <laughs> but there are people that you should avoid. And if it's going, if you're going to get stained, if they're going to influence you against the things that God has already told you, he wants you to do, don't go near them. Don't do it. Anybody who calls himself a brother and is sexually immoral, the scripture says, have nothing to do with them. They're deceived. They're deceived into thinking they're a brother. So the scripture is very clear. There are people that we avoid. I'm not saying don't love people. I'm not giving you an excuse to hold on to bitterness. I'm telling you there are people to avoid because of your own weakness. Any of you have weaknesses? I'm wondering. Okay, some of you. Wow. How many of you have weaknesses? You got weaknesses? Okay, then you know what they are, right? And you know, like, <laughs> mine's the bakery, so I don't go there. <laughs> Second Timothy 3, 4, and 5 says, treacherous, reckless. This is giving a whole list of things people are going to be in the end times. Treacherous, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. These are people who call themselves Christians. It says right here, they have an appearance of godliness. It says have nothing to do with them. Get out like Joseph running from temptation and staying away. There are things you stay away from. Listen, just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's real. You guys know what I'm talking about? You can, get, you can get into 8,000 different conspiracy theories. And the next day, they'll change their mind and tell you, you know, it's just a false alarm. It's a bunch of bananas. So say no daily. It's a good idea. But, but it happened about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside. He smells a rat. There's a setup.
that she caught him by his garment. He always has trouble with his garments. <laughs> Saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and he fled and ran outside. I'm not sure that would be the choice that I would choose before the days of underwear. <laughs> He's completely naked, okay? I mean, I can't prove it. No fruit of the womb going on or anything, but you tear off that outer garment, you're, you're free. You can call him the streak. Better to lose your garment than your character. Better to lose your garment than your character. I've known boyfriends to break up with girlfriends because the girlfriends aren't good for them. They push them into sexual immorality and just take their money and do all sorts of things. And then after an argument, she'll want him back and say, well, your stuff's here at the house. You really should come pick it up. Don't do it. <laughs> just leave it there. Anything that was important, you probably took with you. Don't go back. Just let it go. Say, that's fine. That's the cost of my stupidity. I'll let it go. Run away from temptation. Some people like to lean into it. You know, the whole he-man, woman-haters mentality. Lean, lean into that. You can't tempt me. Watch. I haven't had a drink in years. I'm going to the bar. I'm going to sit with all those people. Watch. I won't drink. Why are you doing that? That's like standing on the edge of a cliff with the wind at your back on a windy day. Why would you do that? You're asking for trouble. So he runs. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27 says, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? Joseph was running away. That's part of the running the race. And so run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Any of you know that your body can be your worst enemy? I have desires periodically to eat an entire pizza. So I don't go to the pizza place. I have salad. Believe it or not. Running the race means you're running away from something and you're running towards someone who's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them. Interesting choice of who to tell saying, see, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. Who brought the Hebrew into the house? Potiphar. Potiphar. She's bad-mouthing her husband. To these men of the house, which I wonder if she's ever propositioned them. He's brought in this Hebrew to mock us. He came to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. Didn't you hear me? And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and he fled and went outside. And so she kept his garment with her until his master came home. So she devised this plan to pin it all on Joseph. He's being tested again. What do you think all of the men of the house are thinking? This guy is... He came in as a stranger. He's probably still very, very young, and he's over all of them. You know he's despised, just like his brothers despised him. And now he's got this battle. He's got this test of unpopularity. You, you are not going to be a popular person anymore. Everybody's going to be angry at you. You ever have that happen? Something happened at work, and everybody's mad at you? In the military, if they said left face and you turn right, everybody had to drop and give 60 push-ups. And there were people who didn't know their left from their right. Happened all the time. Left face. Oh, gee. Right, everybody drop. Give me 60 push-ups. And a whole platoon of guys doing 60 push-ups. We all get back up. Let's try that again. Same guy. <laughs> <laughs> she 
she devises this thing to pin it on him and he's innocent. He's innocent. It's one of those things that's so just incredibly unfair that you wonder why, it, why is this happening? God is involved, by the way, in all of this. So then she spoke to him with words like these saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came into me and mocking me. And so it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard the words of his wife that she spoke to him saying, your servant did this to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. He was angry. Somebody, my wife comes to me and says, hey, this guy hit on me and tried to rape me. I'm going to ask for some backup because you're going to have to hold me back. He was angry. But I'm not sure he was angry at Joseph. I'm not sure he was angry at Joseph. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. By the way, the penalty for attempted rape in Egypt at this time was the death penalty. So why didn't he kill him? Because he knew Joseph's character. He also knew what kind of woman he had married. When Potiphar got angry, he was angry at his wife because his wife just messed up an awesome deal because he had a great servant in the house and he just lost him because the wife had to make up a story. But he's married to the woman, so what do you do? You have to do something. You can't tell her, oh, get out of here. You can't treat it lightly. Your whole house will fall apart. She'll get those men of the house and overthrow you. Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. We see this, we see this in the fact that Joseph and Potiphar are at odds. But Potiphar knows the deal. And he knows he's a righteous man. And so he lets him go. And he puts him in prison. So why is Joseph in prison? If he's innocent, don't you wonder why these things happen? There's this trial of injustice where he is being falsely accused. He's been thrown in prison and he didn't do anything wrong. How would you feel? I would be defending myself left and right. I'd be getting a lawyer. You know, I'd be working my way out of it. Do you understand? God put him here. God has a plan on the other side of this. He has to be here to be able to catch next week the guys that are going to come into the prison, that are going to have dreams, and he's going to interpret them. He's going to be the right guy in the right place. You know, it might be that Jules avoided a deer and had an accident with his car because there's somebody at the hospital that needs Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God does things like that, and we don't see that. We just look, oh, what was me, look. <laughs> God put him here. God put you wherever you are, too. Maybe it was your own fault. Maybe you did something stupid. I do that all the time. I get in trouble. I do. But Joseph's here because the Lord has placed him there. And you don't hear a whisper out of him in complaint. What a great principle for me to follow. God wants him there. Verse 21. But the, word, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. <laughs> but the Lord was with Joseph. Amen. It doesn't matter where you go. If the Lord's with you, you're right where you should be. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. And the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. You noticing a theme? Yep. Joseph does not need somebody looking over his shoulder telling him what to do because he's, he's already doing the right thing. And he's in jail which makes you wonder. 
So you say, here you go, Joseph, have the keys, do whatever you want, go wherever you like. I don't think you as a slave uh, committed to prison forever will try to escape. That doesn't sound very smart. But you see, the Lord was with him. And he saw that the Lord was with him. Because when the Lord's with you, people see that. A city on a hill can't be hidden. What a coincidence. All of this happens just as coincidence. We're going to see coincidence after coincidence happen. You know, that's not a kosher word. It's not kosher at all. Because God is superintending all of the events of this crazy life that he's living right now to preserve the family of God where the Christ would come. In James 1.17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Every good thing, every perfect thing comes from God. Amen. Don't wait for Thanksgiving to be thankful. Don't, you know, count your many blessings. Count them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. It's the old hymn. Some of you don't know that. You know, we have so much to be thankful for that God's given to us. And even in a place where Joseph is, God is showing him mercy. Right. He was with his parents, went to the pit. He was in the hands of Potiphar. He was in prison. God is going to prosper him out of that place. And he's going to end up with Pharaoh on the throne in the palace. That's his, that's his direction and that's where he's headed. You know, the story of you is exactly the same. I hope there was a time when you understood that you were in the pit and you were disowned and hated and, and you were without hope in this world. And then you discovered and realized Jesus Christ came and died for your sin so that you might be saved. So that by having faith in him, that you would have eternal life because Jesus took the punishment that you and I have earned. And by giving our lives to him and saying, Lord, my life is yours. I know Jesus came to die for my sins. I know that I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. Father, forgive me and come into my life and take me. I repent of my sins. I'm yours. I hope every single person, every one of you has had this experience. Because if you, if you don't get there, you're never going to end up in the palace. You'll always be in the pit. So, it's like a potpourri here today, guys. This is the last slide. He went through the test of obscurity, being forgotten, forlorn, with no one as his friend. He went through the test of authority. When he had choice, he could do anything he wanted in Potiphar's house. And he chose to do what was right. He had the test of autonomy. He could do whatever he wanted to do, go wherever he wanted to do. As a slave, he had it really, really good. He had the test of purity. He was tempted. Come lie with me. He says no, because his priorities are straight. He's tested. Is God the most important thing or is your pleasure the most important thing? I can tell you lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God is a key sign of the end of the age. And we've got that in buckets. The test of pliability because she went to him every single day and propositioned him and he just avoided her. Let's see if I can manipulate him. Let's see if I can wear him down. Nope, he passed that test too. The test of vulnerability. He had to run out naked. He was willing to leave his clothes just to get away, to preserve himself. And he was completely wide open naked. By the way, a Hebrew among Egyptians. The test of unpopularity. She went and told the men of the house what had happened and that made up this story that she was a, there was a rape attempt. It was a test of insincerity. She was not honest. She didn't tell the truth. It's funny, you never see Potiphar have a conversation with Joseph about what happened. I think it happened. That's why he went to jail and he wasn't killed. The test of insincerity. Hey, I've been lied against. The test of injustice. I've been thrown in jail and I'm innocent. Would you be able to pass these tests? It's difficult. That injustice one is really difficult. And now the test of captivity. He's in jail. 
I don't know if you've ever been forced to be in jail. I think some of you have. I won't point you out or mention your names. But the greatest thing is you lose freedom. You will eat what they give you. You will sleep where they put you. You will use the bathroom in sight of anyone that happens to be in your cell. You, there's no privacy. There's no freedom. And he's now in jail. But he doesn't stay there for very long because the Lord is with him. And the Lord has a destination for him. I wonder at what stage are you on that list? What test are you being put through to the place where God's going to put you in the palace? And Micah 6, 8, it's a nice little pithy reminder for us. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? If you had to break down what it is, what the Christian life is, you could break it down into those three things in Micah. Joseph is a great picture of that, and certainly Jesus Christ comes and is the perfect picture of that. Romans 6.13 says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members, your, the parts of your body, as instruments of righteousness to God. Joseph did this. His mind was given over, his emotions were given over, and even his physical body was given over to the service of the Lord and others. And he didn't compromise. It's a great picture for us. It's a great encouragement for me. Because you see, Jesus could do this, but Jesus was God. Joseph is just a guy. If he can do it, then you and I should. And we know a whole lot more, and we have a whole lot more help because the Spirit of God lives in us. He was with his parents. He got sent to the pit. He ended up with Potiphar, went to prison. He prospered and ended up with Pharaoh in the palace. I didn't put Pharaoh because it didn't have a P sound. <laughs> but it had the P letter. Run from sin and run to the Savior. I'm going to welcome the worship team to come up at this point in time. Is there something in your life that you should be running from? I can tell you there's someone that you should be running to. Because that's the way it happens. Amen.